All right. So, uh, yeah, my, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Satish Chandra. Uh, I am here to host uh, a talk by Jean Yang. Uh, professor uh, Jean Yang is a, an assistant professor at CMU, uh, but uh, during the last uh, year or so, she has been um, uh, start. She has been working in launching her own startup, Akita Software, uh, here in Silicon Valley. And Akita works on wonderful things such as finding uh, problems with your APIs, and we look forward to hearing all about that from. Uh, Jean. So Jean, over to you. And after your talk, we will have much more to chat about. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Satish. It's, uh, it's great to be here on this um, wonderful Sunday virtually. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting way to give a talk and I'm, I'm really excited to try it out. And so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. Cool. So can you see um, my opening slide? Okay, great. So um, I, uh, yeah, cool. So I really like to be very interactive in these talks because um, what I realized through doing virtual fitness classes is if uh, the instructor even says my name, like they don't have to say anything else. They just have to say Gene at some point in the talk or in the, in the class, I'm much more likely to come back. So I, um, I've loaded the, the chat onto a different laptop over here. This is um, how much I believe in, in saying, saying your names. So if you just, uh, if you, if you chat me at all during the talk, I'm, I'm going to keep on looking over. Satisha is going to keep on looking over and uh, we're going to try to make this as interactive as possible for for this session so um yeah so i'm here uh today to talk about why i'm now working on apis all of the fun and profit in um in applying systems thinking lessons to apis essentially and um i'm hoping to make this a very interactive talk so yes thank you guys thank you jonathan <laughs> and thank you uh thank you krista for saying things in the chat so far if you say anything in the chat i'm happy to say your name um cool so um just to scope this uh because this is a pretty different world than a lot of the the pl work that people are doing these are about web uh web apis so um uh, like http rest apis and, and what have you cool so um so I'll start by just uh, talking about the promise of these web APIs. On the side of the API users, it's supposed to be like getting breakfast delivered and in bed by a butler. So things like Stripe API, Twilio API, you hear about these APIs and it's like, oh cool, if I build an app, all I have to do is call a bunch of APIs. And um, it's, it's kind of true to some extent. So uh, I recently judged a hackathon um, of college students and the kinds of apps they were able to build just in one one weekend is, is what it would, it would have taken us like six months to build this when I was in school because of the the lack of uh, ready-made programmable, programmable functions to call and then the promise on the other side is if you build an API um, for, for your company then you're just getting money flowing in all over the place because everyone can just configure and program um, everything all the time but in practice, I've been talking to a lot of developers and the reality is uh, it's kind of like playing Jenga with charcoals. You take out any piece, you put in any piece, and then it, uh, it's just a fire all over the place. So on, on the one hand, you have um, any API you use, it can cause you to come crashing down at any point. And so one of the most recent ones was uh, the Facebook SDK was crashing. Uh, sorry, Satish, <laughs> I know you don't work on the Facebook SDK itself, but um, this was a big one. And um, when I talked to a lot of uh, Akita users or potential users, they said, well, you know, we all use Facebook and, and we get very nervous about um, if even Facebook can go down, then any API that we use can take us down. So, so that's very scary. And then on the other hand, if you are maintaining an API and you keep changing it or you're not really... Uh, you're, you're not really telling developers who use it what, what's, what's going on. Um, there's, there's a lot of uh, strife. So again, recently Twitter rolled out their new API, but instead of having these uh, really nice victorious articles saying, go Twitter, here's their new API, most of the articles were actually, Twitter has a very contentious relationship with all their users because their API is, uh, is kind of a, a fraught. So, um, so this talk, um, these are all human things, but but I'll, I'll I'll talk throughout this talk about how this is relevant to to building programming tools and and that kind of thing. Um, 
And so what I'm going to, to talk about is um, how APIs make programming hard. So like, why is it that um, APIs are, are complicating problems? Like, why are people having so much trouble with APIs? And then, um, you know, uh, that's just the outside, what's going on on the inside too. And then the second point, there's a lot of ways to put it, but um, this is, uh, there are a lot of PL researchers in this in this audience, and uh, you know, I, I consider myself one too, but it's really why PL researchers should work, should work on the software heterogeneity problem. If you haven't heard of this term before today, that's okay. I made it up recently, but um, but I'm I'm just outlining a, a problem that I've observed in the last many years. Um, I'll talk about why it's hard, and I'll talk about the dimensions of the problem so we can solve it. And then I'll talk about why I believe that modeling behavior at the API level is the way. And so I think that I'm still trying to figure out how to convey this, uh, what we're doing to the world. But really, I think APIs are the solution to a lot of software modeling problems, not just, you know, at the API level itself. And so I hope to convey why that is the case. And so I'm... Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Satish, for chatting to me. Um, and everybody else, please continue using the chat throughout this talk, because if you don't use the chat, I don't know you're there, because I can't see you. This is a virtual talk. So, um, yeah, I can see some of you in the Zoom. Thank you for your expressions. But, uh, but yeah, everyone, please keep using the talk, the, the chat. Um, cool. And if, if, there, if you can't hear me, just tell me to speak louder. I'm using this, like, fuzzy microphone, but, um, again, I can't hear myself, so... Cool. So um, for just a little bit of background about me, um, oh yeah, I also don't really have any up-to-date photos. This is like the highest res photo I have of myself. But um, as Satish mentioned, I was working on programming systems and tools in academia. I was previously an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon University. I took leave in 2018, and I actually officially left to focus on um, Akita full-time. Previously, I was publishing in venues like Popol, PLDI, and ICFP. And so I think for a while, people are, were very confused what a nice programming language is research like me was doing working on APIs, um, especially web APIs. But um, I don't know, Patrice Godefraud is also working on APIs. I think it's cool now. So hopefully I'll explain all of this throughout the course of this talk. I've come to believe that it's that that's the solution to all problems. So I, I've been working on Akita for um, a couple of years now. Thank you, Lucas, for saying I sound fine. Um, and thank you for the shout out to Twilio and the chat messages, another API. Loving the chat. Cool. Um, and just to, to kind of uh, show you where I'm giving the talk from, this is my setup right now. There's my, my, my fuzzy mic. So as you can see, it actually um, blocks a lot of my screen. So I can't really see some of this that's going on. Um, but I, I also, I, I have a sad news, which is that bottle of sriracha that was there when I took the photo has since developed a lot of gray, like furry things inside. So I, I had to throw it out. But my desk has gotten a lot messier since then, so I haven't been able to take a new, new photo. Um, and then um, for a little bit more about me, just to build up suspense about APIs and to kind of give you an idea of how I got here, um, I was working on pretty traditional like non-web API stuff for a while. So my first paper was um, verifying operating systems at a low level. I did most of my PhD work on um, how do we enforce information flow uh, policies. But it was then, it was there that things started really um, kind of uh, going into despair for me. So I started building, um, I started, uh, I made, I made an information flow uh, programming model, and then I was trying to build web apps using it. And what I learned was the minute you call out to the database in a web app, which is like all the time, all the minutes uh, in a web app, you, you start uh, having to, to call out to a different semantics and a different runtime. And all of the guarantees that you made in your nice, uh, in your nice DSL in your application layer went out the window. And so for me, this, was, um, this involved many years of despair. Like, what do we do about the fact that if we make some nice guarantees in a language, all of the guarantees go out the window the minute you call out to the database? And it got even worse than that. It's not just the database, but it's every other thing that we have a remote procedure call to. Like anytime we call out to anything else, all of our guarantees go out the window. And so um, after many years of despair, I started doing some academic work um, at the API level. So the second to last paper here is um, about enforcing data flow policies at the API level. And then the last paper was really about like, if we don't know what's going on in a system, can we look at traces and figure out like what data and information flow policies are actually being enforced. And so um, 
a lot of my work had been had started moving towards like APIs, legacy code, all this stuff. And um, at the same time, I was I was really uh, I was trying to go to to people in industry, and I was like, well, hey, like I I want to do this kind of work that has to do with traces on your data and like uh, APIs on your on your systems. Can you like give me access to your systems? And the resounding answer was no, we cannot do that <laughs> for you to write papers. And so um, the second part of my uh, my journey to PL and API. APIs was, well, I just started talking to everyone on my LinkedIn, like, hey, uh, can you tell me about your problems around this? And like, will you let me solve it? And uh, I realized that it was it was probably going to be easier to start a company to do this than to keep doing it in academia. So that's what I did. Um, I spent the first year of Akita um, doing a bunch of user research. So I went through and I just conducted like dozens, uh, maybe hundreds of, of user interviews with developers, security engineers, and what have you. Uh, I wrote this blog post on SIGPLAN recently. If you're if you're interested, but um, but essentially, like through this process, I um, I realized that most things I knew were probably wrong, and that I should be thinking about everything a little bit differently. And so, um, so some of some of this talk will be about those lessons as well. And thank you, Jonathan, for saying plus one API behavioral modeling is the way. If I <laughs> we can just keep echo chambering here, but I'll uh, I'll continue. Cool. So after this extremely long lead in, which I, in which I basically told my life story, it's time to now talk about how APIs make programming hard. So I'll start with this blog post that all of you can access by just typing in this really short link uh, down here. But, um, but uh, I thought this blog post really nicely captured what was hard about working with APIs. So um, this is uh, impact analysis at Shopify. So Shopify is a company. Uh, Shopify has an API, which means that in order to access Shopify's functionality, users can just directly call Shopify endpoints instead of having to like configure a web UI or do anything. And this is great for Shopify users because it is super programmable. It's great for Shopify because it makes it really easy for people to just use Shopify and Shopify can make more money. But what is tricky now is that anytime uh, someone, uh, anytime sh someone at Shopify wants to change anything, this might have impacts on their APIs now, and this causes problems for potentially both Shopify and the users. And um, in my in my headlines descending onto the flaming Jenga's, um, you saw this with Facebook, you saw this with Twitter, and pretty much anyone with an external API has this problem that it's really hard to change your API. So if you think about, it's really hard to update your programming language once you um, once you once you get it out there and people are using it. It's it's very similar with APIs because the way I see it is APIs are like little DSLs, and so. Um, if your company, if the whole point of your company is actually just updating your API, it's pretty much similar to someone building a, a programming language, like a compiler or something like that. It's, it's really hard to make any changes. And so they have this great blog post that describes how, you know, you break the API contract with the ecosystem only when there are no alternatives or it's uneconomical to do so otherwise. And um, they, they're basically doing like a, like a, standard PL techniques in some way, like coarse grained tracking of the impacts of these changes. And what they're doing is they're, they're marking things as breaking manually, and then they're instrumenting their code, and then they're, they're sucking out this, um, these, the, the, the metadata to create reports of what might change whenever any change that could impact the API is made, which is probably many changes because like the whole point of Shopify is to allow people to use it. And then their developer relations team goes out and talks to users if there's any ambiguity. And so what was interesting to me about this from a programming languages research point of view was, hey, like this is like stuff that, uh, you know, PL people have kind of figured out um, how to how to track the impact of a change, how to track, you know, this is this is how like downstream things that get affected. Um, but this seems to be at a different abstraction level. And so it's causing a lot of problems. And so from the Shopify blog, again, it seems like any little change actually deeply potentially affects the API. So changing existing error response codes or messages. So that's something that, you know, like any, like <laughs> anything can change this. And so this is, this is like a, you know, pretty, uh, pr pretty dire if you think about it. Um, if you modify the expected payload of webhooks and callbacks, that could be a breaking change, changing the data type of a field, renaming a field. So these are all things that in like a traditional monolithic, 
ecstatic or dynamic analysis point of view, they're kind of solved problems. But for some reason, like all of these modern web companies are struggling with it and they're doing like some pretty extreme manual work to keep track of it. So this became very interesting to me. And so I'm, um, you know, some people might say, well, just teach developers to mark breaking very carefully, mark maybe breaking pretty carefully, and then everything is good. But if there's one thing we know in software engineering research, it's that asking developers to do the same thing over and over again is error prone. That's what the whole field of PL software engineering research is about. And so this is a very interesting problem for us, in my opinion. And so um, when I dug deeper, I learned a little bit more about how existing tools are falling short. And I'll give a very high level summary here. So um, one thing is that like in PL research, we already know this, but diffing source code only goes so far when code hits a certain scale. So Satish, who introduced me, a lot of his work is about this. If you have thousands, millions of lines of code, you really can't do diffs anymore. But the interesting thing is for breaking changes, like what a lot of people are doing is still looking at diffs in perforce and whatever your change management, your code review tool is and comparing that. Um, so, so that's one thing that's, that's failing us. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more in, in like a minute about why uh, the, the, the traditional avenues of combating this aren't working anymore. Um, and then people might ask, well, why aren't tests handling these breaking change cases? And if we'll, we think back to like error code changes, payload changes, tests are usually not so comprehensive. And so unless you have really comprehensive tests, which honestly through interviewing a lot of developers, like most people, like the, the common cases, people are kind of embarrassed and they're like, look, we really don't have that many tests. And my response to them is, this is what most people tell me, there's no need to be embarrassed. But anything that assumes that there are existing tests is pretty much not true. And then there's the question of, well, there have been static and dynamic analysis tools for decades. So what's wrong with those? And something that I learned pretty early on in my developer interview process was developers were pretty smart about articulating what was falling short, actually. They're like, look, static analysis is good for basically like a super powered linter. Or um, when people talk about semantic diffing or something of their code, what they're really talking about is like, you know, we alpha name, like we under, under alpha renaming of variables we can find um, we can find the differences but um but when it comes to like any kind of complex system where you have any subtle interaction and especially when things start calling over the network so anytime you call out to another service which happens a lot in these modern microservices environments um, anytime you call out to a database um, your static and dynamic analysis really falls down and so in in a lot of these modern web systems especially um, you don't have like diffing diffing is just way too primitive like superpower diffing with like semantic diffing is also pretty primitive the tests are just not there and then um even if you had analyses that could handle these dynamically typed languages so, like the fact that you have services or, or any kind of like multi-component system really undermines a lot of the existing tooling and so the dream is automated software tools that fit modern web apps. And my belief is we don't actually have to throw out the techniques that we developed. We just kind of have to tweak them to adapt to uh, a different abstraction level and a different kind of system. And so the rest of the talk is really about that. And so to summarize API efforts in the present day, if you have external APIs that companies with the resources to spend on tooling, like a Shopify, a Stripe, or a Twilio that's powering this chat, um, people have frameworks or they have like these manual mark breaking techniques that kind of make sure the external API doesn't change. But if you're not at this kind of company or you have internal APIs, which is often the case if you have a service oriented architecture, or even if you just have like, you know, three different kinds of data stores, it already starts getting complicated. But everybody else is really left in a parking lot with weeds when it comes to uh, the, the tooling situation. And I think there's a lot that the PL community can do to address that. So that's why I am giving this talk. So I will briefly pause in case anybody wants to say anything in the chat.
but I, I'll also just let it sink in. We have a 40 minute discussion after, so there's plenty of time to discuss. Cool. So now the next section is why is it so bad and why have the tools left people behind so much? Cool. So one big thing that I've learned in the last couple of years is that more and more of software is just APIs now. I mean, I kind of knew this before I dug into this, but here, here's some actual data. So from the Rapid API Developer Survey recently, if you are in a company with 5,000 to 10,000 people, the average number of APIs is over 300. And some of the bigger companies like Uber, they have thousands of APIs, Amazon, Netflix. If you search Amazon Death Star or Netflix Death Star, there's actually a term for this microservice graph now. But but in like a heavily microservices based environment, you have, you know, tens, uh, up to tens of thousands of internal APIs that are not getting the kind of very precise manual tooling that the external APIs are getting. And so in these companies, so, um, uh, there's like the internal versus external API is mostly like a people and process problem, but you have like external APIs that are like pretty much the same as in internal APIs, except they're getting more love because companies are losing money. And then you have this growing amount of internal APIs that's making it harder and harder for, um, for developer tools to really take effect. And so like, uh, I, like, I really grasped the, the difficulty of this problem, like pretty much immediately. Cause I, I had this paper in grad school. I was where I like the motivation was the minute you call out to your database, all of your guarantees get subverted. And what I thought was very cool was when I was doing these developer interviews, people were telling me this, like to me, I didn't have to say it to them. They were like, yeah, the minute you call out to another service, the minute you call out to Redis, Kinesis, like any of your data stores or streams, all of the guarantees get subverted. And I was like, yep, I have, I spent three years of grad school coming up with this paper of Greek symbols to like make sure that one edge uh, got got tamed. So I fully understand if like you're uh, you're having trouble with your 10,000 edges or ho however many you have. So um, I had concluded some years ago that it's not feasible to model like every different edge by hand. And um, how I'll summarize this problem is you have many software components. So you have, you know, like these modern systems are not just one kind of runtime anymore. It's pretty, uh, like there, there's like, you know, many of them. And the bigger problem is that it's heterogeneous. So if you had like, you know, 10,000 components, but they were all running Python or something like that. Well, Python itself defies reasoning in a lot of ways, but that, that would be one story. But what you have here is it's, they're running Python, they're running Node, they're running, um, they're like one kind of data store, another kind of data store. And so like to actually like model the cross component functionality for everything. Like I, I spent like a small amount of time going down that path and my head pretty much just exploded. Um, but it's, um, it's, it's not really modelable in, in like any of the conventional ways. And um, so, so like what you do see is a lot of people kind of just like seeing like, hey, what's roughly going on? Can we do something here? Um, and so I'll, how I summarize this is it's the software heterogeneity problem, which is that in, in these modern web architectures, you have, um, uh, you have many components, they're all different. And so you have this graph of heterogeneous nodes where um, every application level modeling technique pretty much handles one of these nodes at, at a time. And any network level uh, modeling technique handles like one kind of, it sees one edge at a time. So the network techniques people have been having like slightly more success with, but they're all pretty low level because they're not zooming out to the whole graph. So like as a programming languages person, the goal is to structure the whole graph, but like not not, like neither exist, existing application level techniques or network level techniques are zooming out to the whole graph right now. And so to me, that was a huge opportunity to, to do something uh, that was better than what existed. And so the result is that developers are doing a ton of manual work. So if we go back to the change management uh, case, it's really expensive for developers to understand the impact of their code changes to anybody else. So you change any piece of code, like already if you're in a dynamically typed language, you have all these interactions. If you're in a statically typed language, heck, like there's like, you know, when things get big enough, there are all these interactions. Um, but then like factor in the heterogeneity of all these other runtimes you're talking to, it's, it's pretty much like emergent behaviors at this point. And then it's also really hard to understand, like if you're depending on a bunch of other components, it's really hard to reason about that as well. And so 
I think one way to look at it is you could just give up on using, you know, formal modeling techniques for any of this, but I don't think that has to be the case. I think we just have to shift our perspective. And so the rest of this talk is, is really about that. And actually my screensaver came on. So now is a good time for me to go back and look at the chat in case. Um, cool. Thanks for, thanks for chatting guys. Thanks Satish for the positive commentary throughout. Um, cool. So now, now to the topic that Jonathan Aldrich has already endorsed, why API based behavioral modeling is the way. And so what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about what we've been doing at Akita. And um, this is still very early days. There's plenty of room for, for other people to work on this. So for instance, I was recently talking with Nadia uh, Perlikopova at UC San Diego about doing some work on some of this stuff. If anybody else wants to talk about this, I'm, I'm happy to talk. But, um, but yeah. So, um, so first I'll start by what we learned about what developers want, because that really informed uh, how we decided to set things up. So the, here are some things we learned. So one is getting a report of everything that could happen is not useful since almost anything could happen in these systems. So um, one thing about like these, especially these like multi-component service oriented systems is if you think about what like a static, so in the beginning people are like, oh, so can you, like maybe like a static analysis of like how APIs talk to each other could be useful. And like very early on, I was like, no, 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 no. Because if you think about what like a static analysis does is it tells you how anything like like everything that could possibly happen and if you have a system that's massively decentralized with configurable pieces if the configurable pieces are worth their salt in any way anything should be able to talk to each other and so your existing kinds of analyses of like the structure of a system should like not work by definition of like how these things are put together. Um, so that was when we decided that like any like like the static kinds of analyses that um like I had been working on, for example, were not going to cut it. Um, what the other thing we learned, so that that was actually kind of surprising to me. Like it, maybe it shouldn't have been, but I was like, man, <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> like like half of the things I know are just not useful in this domain. Um, the the other thing I learned was the more actionable the reporting, the more like likely bugs are to be fixed. So again, maybe this should have been more obvious to me when I started. But what these developers said was, look, like we don't want to know anything that could happen. It actually just like makes our lives harder. It, it it's actually better for us to get fewer bugs reported to us, but like. All of them we know how to fix and so um what this uh what this message to me was uh they're like so a, a conversation i had with satish recently was uh like we don't care about if a bug can happen anymore we care about you know how likely the bug is to happen and then another thing i'll add to that is not just how likely the bug is to happen but is there some kind of actionability on top of that um, and so again, this, this kind of took me away from like static techniques more into like, how can we get, uh, how can we, how can we get some sense of, you know, issues, um, be as close as possible to the source of the issue so that there's some, some action tied to it. And then, um, tell people as, as, as soon as possible. So it's easy for, for them to fix. And then the final thing that was, um, kind of, uh, again, surprisingly surprising to me, <laughs> maybe it shouldn't have been, is that the easier it is to integrate the tool, the more likely it is that people will try it. So like most of the language-based stuff I'd been working on before, people would have to make, they would have to write their code in a complete, completely new language. And even if I implemented it as a library, they would have to do something completely different to get that to work. And so, um, what I realized we needed was the more your thing can work with legacy systems, the more it can work with existing APIs, the more it can work with GitHub, with existing CI tools, the more likely it is to actually have an impact. And so these three lessons really informed a lot of how we decided to to go about our solution. And so what we concluded was we wanted something black box. We didn't want to make any code changes. Um, we wanted something that could easily integrate with everything people were using already. So no, no new library, no new kind of system. We're not making like, you know, Docker version two or anything like that or Kubernetes version two. Um, and we also wanted to, it to be a dynamic analysis based solution, um, like a black box dynamic analysis based solution, which really um, ties your hands like one way to look at it is it super ties your hands as a PL researcher. Another way to look at it is that it poses a very interesting set of challenges that are actually pretty fun to, to work on. 
So our goal when, um, well, not when we started Akita, because we had to learn all these lessons like in the first few months, but at, at some point our goal became build a tool that's frictionless to integrate, gives actionable feedback and helps developers catch breaking changes. So what we wanted to do was like black box, dynamically look at something and be able to help people catch when, uh, when bad things get introduced. And so this is where an interesting revelation came into play, which is we were like, all right, we want to model web apps. What this means is we want a standard way to describe what each service does. We want a standard way to talk about how these services interact. And then ideally, we want a standard way to connect the specification to the code. And over the last few years, some of you might know this already, there's actually been a ton of standardization that um, was not inevitable. It was the result of the hard work of a lot of people around API specification protocols. So that's um, things like Open API Swagger, gRPC, Thrift from Facebook, GraphQL from Facebook. But you know, people have standardized on these API protocols. Um, and what they do is they describe the structure of the endpoint. So they describe the type of the values coming in, the type of the values coming out, and also like uh like a good byte code you can stuff a bunch of other stuff in there you can have like other fields where you can put any additional structured information that you want to put in there and so to us we're like hey this is pretty cool like there's already some light documentation at the api protocol layer but you know these api protocols are pretty structured in a standard way so if we can somehow piggyback off of the existing ways to model api specs that would be awesome because it's, it's already you know like halfway halfway there and so we're like, okay, what if we analyzed API specs and we analyzed API traces to get those specs instead of programs and program traces? But there is a catch. So API specs are not easy to come by, actually. Uh, only 35% of API providers feel that their organization's documentation is above average. And if you think about, like, if you ask parents, like, you know, how many of you think your child is above average? It's like 100% of their parent of parents think their children are above average. So this means it's like probably much lower than 35%. And this makes sense because, you know, like, there are tools out there, like Postman and Insomnia, great tools. But what they're doing is they're giving you really like super powered curl so you know you, you make curl requests you can call an api postman lets you store those curl requests share those curl requests but it's not telling you what curl request to make or like how to modify your curl request if it's not working and so like the the like level of tooling at the api level like if you compare it to the level of tooling we have for languages is like much 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 more pr primitive and then there's like also libraries and frameworks you can use to auto generate api specs but most people are not using them they're using like you know like if you have an external api at like a company like stripe you will be using that stuff but like for internal apis forget it and so like api specs are not really even a thing to start with there are like they there's a structure that exists but most people are not not using that that structure right now and so our challenge was how do we mo automatically model api behavior with as little developer effort as possible and like you know can we can we get these apis somehow from like just just like you know other 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 sources of input and so what we realized was you can actually apply a lot of programming languages magic to modeling at the API level. And so if you think about the uh, techniques like invariant generation or type inference or any kind of trace based analysis, like you can use those to like, like rest APIs are actually a pretty limited structure. And so they are an easier thing to, uh, to infer the structure of than most things that people are looking for when they're doing spec mining. So, so like, the, so the specification mining papers are something that we've been reading a lot of, but you know, they're actually doing a much harder version of what we were trying to do with APIs. So what we learned is that you know, there's a lot of great work um, that took you know, things from formal methods and talked about this is how you mine for it. This is how you, you know, combine, uh, combine information from different parts of the structure to get this information. And you can apply all of this at the API level. And um, something else that we, we've been playing around with a lot is actually API-based fuzzing and API-based automated testing, which there's a ton of advantages to because of the, the simple nature of APIs. Um, but this was, um, this was something that we realized like is very underexplored. So like I said, Patrice Godefraud at um, Microsoft Research has, um, he has three really 
great papers on doing this kind of thing at the API level. Koshik Sun at Berkeley has been doing a bunch of API level like fuzzing stuff. Um, but I think that a lot of people working on these kinds of techniques, they're not looking at um, web web APIs. I think um, uh, but you know, like some, some, like people are, I haven't cited everybody. So sorry if I have not explicitly cited you. Um, but there's, there's some good work here, but I think a, a lot of people are not really thinking about this. Um, w like where, while working on these web APIs, I believe would have massive, massive impact, especially since the languages being used are like so, so unruly. And so um, I'm going to really quickly demo what we're doing at Akita at the end, um, just to give you like a concrete idea that this is like a real thing um, yeah. that like people can use. Uh, so really quickly, what we're doing at Akita is we're dynamically modeling API behavior by watching API traffic. Um, we're like one of the big uh, killer features that we're building is diffing. So like you can diff on these models, which um, I, I think is going to be really powerful. And what we're building towards is mapping out the graph of um of of your uh, of your API interactions, and so I'm just gonna switch to a demo really quickly. Um, I will also again pull up the chat um, to to see if there are comments. But what I'm gonna do, because especially because we're we're pretty low on time, is just really quickly show you a demo. So um. Akita runs as either a command line agent or it accepts HAR files, HTML archive files. So I'm just going to put up a test service really quickly. Um, this is, it's called Occubox. It's a mini file sharing system like Box or Dropbox. I'm going to run the Akita command line agent. So it's just listening at port 8080. It's like a Wireshark or just like listens to network traffic. And then I'm going to run some network generating tests. So if you have existing tests that call um, across the network, you can also run this in production, or um, you can actually modify your tests to run across the network if they don't. Um, we have a blog post on the Akita blog about how someone echoes all of their Flask tests to do this. Um, but as long as Akita sees traffic, it can generate a spec. And so um, if we go here, we can just quickly see. Uh, so for those of you who are familiar with open API specs, what we have here is any endpoint that we called, um, we give you a way to browse the endpoints here. So we created a file, created a folder, created a user. So anything that we see, we can capture as a spec. Um, normally the open API specs uh, talk about like basic endpoint, like basic types, like string and things like that. We realize that it's much more useful if you can diff on precise data types. So here we added an additional little Akita structure that's formats. This is your, um, uh, this is a specific email format and this is just JSON. So like for, uh, one thing that's coming up next is we're going to infer implicit API contracts. Um, but for any kind of invariant that you might want over your code, you can just encode it as JSON and put it into your spec here. And that's something that I think is, is very powerful and, and potentially very cool. Um, and then we also have a, um, a, a GitHub integration that lets you um, get a GitHub comment anytime you make a change. So hold on, let me... Um, Actually, in the interest of time, um, wait, let me check out to master. Um, sorry. All right, so I made a demo branch for um, for this talk. And so now uh, I'm not gonna get into the details, but all I'm gonna do is uncomment an endpoint for registering a phone number. I'm going to uncomment an endpoint for uh, adding a test for that phone number. And then I'm going to show you the GitHub comment that says you added an endpoint and you added a, um, a data type. So we're going to stage all track changes. We're going to add phone number endpoint. And then we're going to make a pull request. And then Satish said, if he's getting all the gifts on my slides, is he watching too much TV? I think maybe it might be listening to too much uh, Taylor Swift songs. <laughs> maybe, uh, and watching the music videos, maybe. Um, but thank you, Satish, for continuing to comment. 
Um, cool. So what uh, what this is doing now is Akita is going to run uh, Circle CI for the newest test. It's going to make an API model based on the new test, and then it's going to diff based on the old tests. And this is going to take a couple of minutes. So I'm going to do my last slide really quickly, and then we're going to come here because I know I'm already running over time. So um, the key takeaways is um, I believe working at the API level is a great way, is a great solution for the cross-language, cross-runtime problem. That was the problem that plagued me for most of my PhD. Um, and I hope I've convinced you that you can apply a lot of interesting programming languages and software engineering techniques at the API level. So if you're a PL researcher, I think you can work at this level. If you're an industry person, I think you can be asking a lot more of your API tools, to be honest. Um, there's a lot of techniques that you could apply. Um, you might know them already or ask around, but, um, but yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of tooling to build. And, um, as, as software moves more towards being dependent on third-party APIs, being dependent on microservices and service-oriented architectures, I think this kind of thing is gonna be way more common. There's gonna be a lot more demand for this. So I think everyone should be thinking a lot more about API tooling as programming tooling and APIs as DSLs and thinking about how can we make programming easier at this level. And so you can find us online. We are hiring. So if you thought this was cool, we're, we are looking for, um, for some engineers to join us. Um, and you can find us on Twitter. That's where um, I, that's where I live. Um, but yeah, if you, if you want to talk to us, that is the place to talk to us. Um, cool. And this just loaded. So um, this is, I would say like V0 of our GitHub commenting. But what we did was we added the phone number endpoint. And here we're summarizing that we noticed we saw you. We saw you add the register phone endpoint. We saw the endpoints you changed. And we saw that you had a new phone number data type. And our hope is that whenever you introduce any kind of change having to do with reliability, having to do with diagnostics for performance, having to do with security, we um, should be able to let you know automatically by watching your APIs. So cool. Yeah, so that is my talk. Seems like at least Alan has questions. Um, Satish, I guess you can transition us to, um, to, the, to the discussion portion now. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Jean, for that uh, great talk. Um, let me uh, clap as it's traditional. Um, Let's see, so Alan, can you